Good evening, everyone. Welcome in to Vol Society Live on this Tuesday night. My name is David Morrison from the Vol Society, here to bring you another exciting episode of Vol Society Live. This is your show. This is the show for the fans. And, uh, you know, like I said, the, our social media pages, we have a chat. Of course, our chat room is officially open with our social media pages, whether you're watching us on Facebook, YouTube, or X. Leave a comment, a question. We will read your questions tonight. Uh, about anything University of Tennessee athletics related. Uh, and uh, like I said, we'll read it to you. We'll give you a shout out tonight. And uh, yeah, should be a lot of fun. The first shout out will go to Bill. Bill leaving us a like on the Facebook page. Just that easy. We'll give you a shout out that quick. Um, like I said, we got a lot to talk about tonight. Like I said, we'll read your comments and your questions if the show goes along. But, you know, of course, we'll talk about all the headlines going on. A uh, busy weekend at the University of Tennessee. A lot going on, of course. Uh, usually is around this time, especially with the orange and white game going on uh, over the weekend. Usually, the University of Tennessee always tries to their best, try their best to get all the athletic teams at home the entire weekend, so you know the ball fans can take a look at it. But you know, you had the orange and white game going on. You had a big time baseball series going on over the weekend. With, 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 uh, talk about that tonight and of course you had a lot of recruiting going on this weekend and transfer portal and uh, a lot of stuff going on there but uh, like I said you know uh, leave your comments and your questions uh, as we go along all right so let's talk about that orange and white game uh, that took place on Saturday um, you know I, I kind of expected what I thought I would see on uh, Saturday you know you know, like I said, once again, second year in a row, limited crowd due to the construction at Elon Stadium, so about 10,000 fans there. Um, you know, kind of just basic offense. You know, you had a lot of guys, you know, either injured from the spring practice or you had, you know, uh, Coach Heupel, you know, holding some guys out just as precautionary. You don't want them to get them hurt uh, in the game. Shout out to Hal, leaving us a like on the Facebook page. But, um yeah, kind of a uh, kind of a slow start for the offense early on. Uh, very first play, Nico got sacked. Even though, you know, a sack in the Orange and White game is just you know you touch the quarterback and he automatically goes down. But uh, took a little bit for the offense to kind of get going. Uh, no scoring uh, much in that first quarter. But then you know the second quarter really kind of got going. Uh, you know, Gaston Moore uh, looked really good. Uh, he's pretty much your number two quarterback. Uh, this year, although Jake Merglinger looked really well too, and I'll get to Jake in just a moment, but uh, you know, uh, but the gas man Gaston Moore looked really good. A couple of touchdowns in the game, uh, you know, he found uh, I think he threw one Dayton Sneed, uh, the first touchdown of the game, uh, and then he ended up finding uh, the two lane transfer Chris Brazel the second uh, later on in the orange and white game. So looked very solid. And then Nico finally got going. He threw uh, his only touchdown pass. He found Chaz Nimrod uh, from about like 25 yards out. So pretty solid play. Had a couple of nice throws down the field. And Nico ended up finishing the day uh, seven for nine for 96 yards and a touchdown. So not a bad showing for Nico Iamaliava. Obviously going to be the starting quarterback going into next year. Um, and uh, like I said, just a nice way to kind of end his spring practice. Uh, even Gaston Moore looked really good too. Uh, but probably the biggest uh, the biggest takeaway from that orange and white game was how great the wide receivers look and freshman quarterback Jake Merglinger. So let's talk about Jake Merglinger really quick since we're still on this quarterback talk here. Uh, Jake Merglinger really, you know, opened some eyes in this orange and white game, looked really well. Uh, I guess it was kind of, a, you know, Merklinger is going to be your third string quarterback. It, you know, it's kind of the same story in last year's orange and white game where Gaston Moore really came out on the scene and really broke out. But, you know, we didn't see Gaston Moore play much in the fall, obviously. Uh, but, you know, Merklinger, you know, the true freshman, uh, finished today five for six, 105 yards, a touchdown, and uh, had a couple of runs, which one of them went for a touchdown. So 42 yards on the ground rushing. Uh, you know, Merklinger ran for 34, 31 touchdowns in high school. 
so really just opened a lot of eyes. And, of course, he ended up hit, hitting that 63-yard touchdown pass to Mike Matthews uh, in the game. And, uh, you know, so really good showing for Merk Linger. Um, like I said, I don't expect Merk Linger to see the field much except in mop-up duty, obviously. Uh, but, you know, it definitely adds some depth and some excitement in that quarterback room. And keep in mind, you still have another five-star quarterback coming in the following year in George McIntyre. Of course, George McIntyre is still at, in high school. Uh, but the quarterback room is looking really well for Josh Heupel uh, moving forward in the in the future. So very, not, very nice to see uh, how these quarterbacks are looking. And then the wide receivers just look fantastic. Looks very deep. Uh, uh, Dante Thornton, you know, was injured most of last year. Um, matter of fact, I missed the spring game last year and then missed most of the, uh, the fall. Finally got healthy somewhat and looked really good. Then he got hurt in that Missouri game, was out for the year. But Thornton looks like what we thought we were going to see from him last year. So excited to see that. Uh, Caleb Webb looked really well. Chas Nimrod looked great. Obviously got a touchdown in the orange wide game. Uh, you know, score white, you know, looks solid. I uh, didn't see a lot of him, obviously. Uh, and of course, you know, Brew McCoy still coming back from the injury. From what I'm hearing, he is really, uh, progressed well ahead of schedule. So that's good to hear. Um, but you know, I'm kind of, uh, I don't want to say I'm skeptical of Brew. I, you know, I, I'm, kind of preparing myself not to kind of see the the same Brew McCoy we saw from before just coming back from that injury. But, you know, even with Brew coming back into the lineup, I feel very confident about this wide receiver room. And then, you know, even a Mike Matthews, so, you know, five-star wide receiver himself, I, I expect to see him play in the fall. And, 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 and you know, pretty uh, funny story with Mike Matthews Saturday – so, you know, Mike Matthews, even though he graduated back in December, he's still technically a high school senior. So he played in the orange and white game, scored a 63-yard touchdown pass uh, from uh, Jake Merklinger. Then Mike Matthews ended up leaving the fourth quarter in the orange and white game to go to his high school prom down in Georgia. So <laughs> talk about a, a, a very eventful day for uh, Mike Matthews. Uh, you know, scoring a touchdown in Neyland Stadium, mind you, a spring game, and then uh, going to your high school prom. That's a, that's a pretty uh, pretty good day for him, and uh, I'm sure he was probably the most popular guy at that uh, at that prom. <laughs> uh, shout out to Dennis, leaving us a like on the Facebook. Uh, leave your comments and your questions tonight, uh, whether you watch us on Facebook, YouTube, or X. I will read those out tonight. Um, but, yeah, this is kind of what I expected. Uh, the defense looked solid for the most part. Um, you know, I, I thought the D line looked great. Um, saw a lot of saw a lot of guys play on that D line and uh, made nice plays for the most part. And of course, that, it, that is a very stack defensive line that Ronnie Gardner's got. We mentioned last week, kind of previewing the Orange and White game. You know, you could see twelve guys play almost every Saturday. I mean, it's it's that deep, uh, just rotating guys in and out and. Uh, uh, we didn't see Pierce in the game. Uh, Pierce was held out. Uh, not He's not injured, just kind of, you know, don't want to take that chance if he does get hurt. Um, but everybody else, for the most part, kind of played or semi-played. Um, and then uh, linebackers look fairly well. Kenny Peely, good to see him back out there. Uh, coming back, you know, he was injured in the Virginia game last year, and that really kind of set the tone for the linebacker room. Um, and I'll get to uh, Elijah Herring in just a moment. But I thought they looked fairly well for the most part. And, um, you know, a, a, a group that is building some depth, even though now with the departure of Elijah Herring. And I'll go, I might as well go ahead and mention it. So uh, news broke yesterday that uh, as the transfer portal, the spring window opened back up again. Uh, Tennessee did take a hit in that as Elijah Herring, who led the team in tackles last year with 80, uh, has announced that he is entering the transfer portal. Um, some, you know, some ball fans are kind of surprised by it. Some are not. I'm 
kind of in the middle, I guess you could say, um, with it. But, you know, like I said, Elijah Herring kind of got thrown into a uh, a big-time spot right after Peely's injury in the Virginia game. And then uh, you know, was just thrust into the starting lineup, started 11 games. He, you know, he led the team in tackles, but we kind of saw that linebacker group just at times kind of be inconsistent, was kind of slow on tackles and uh, the reaction. Uh, and we kind of saw a rotating group uh, between, you know, Herring and um, Arian Carter and, and just uh, T. Lander at times, which I think T. Lander can be a playmaker for us this year. Uh, he's really looked really well, and even in the orange white game. Uh, but you know, now Tennessee is going to be down a linebacker. I don't think this is a a big issue. Um, because I think they've got pretty good depth. I think it's going to be Peely and Carter and T Lander that's going to be really making up that linebacker room. Um, and, and along with you know, some of the freshmen coming in, but you know, that. Uh, that is, you know, you did lose 80 tackles right there from last year's team that you, you know, kind of thought you were going to at least have some of that back. But it is what it is. It's kind of where college football is. Personally, I am I'm I really don't like the spring window as far as the transfer portal goes. I think if you're going to do a transfer portal, uh, I would just do it right at the end of the regular season. Or not regular season. Uh, right at the end of the playoffs. Let me clarify my words there. Uh, right as soon as the national championship game's over with, I think that's when it should be the transfer portal opened up is around January, February, and then get your roster kind of set up for spring practice. Um, but, you know, <laughs> I'm about to uh, mention Tennessee needs to get a, a position player in the transfer portal, um, or at least a key position here in a moment. So, anyways, uh, you know, that's just my two cents on it, but, you know, be interesting to see. Of course, uh, Elijah's brother Caleb Herring is also on the roster. Um, you know, so I'm not going to speculate what he's thinking. Uh, I don't want to say anything that is a false narrative. Uh, but you know, there's you know, it's definitely uh, ball fans are kind of looking at that too. So we'll see what the future holds there. Um, moving on, like I said, you know, as far as what I also think Tennessee needs to look out for as far as the transfer portal goes uh, is the running backs. Uh, so the running back room right now at Tennessee is, in my opinion right now, probably the weakest. Uh, I know that a lot of people talk about the secondary. I'm actually not concerned too much about the secondary. Matter of fact, they look okay for the most part. Um, uh, but I think the running back room right now uh, desperately needs to kind of pick somebody up in the transfer portal. Uh, so Dylan Sampson did not play in the orange and white game, uh, mainly due to just precautionary. Um, yeah. And Ryan watching us on Facebook says a few, a uh, few running backs hurt, right? Yeah. Yeah. There's quite a few that's hurt. Uh, so Sampson didn't play. Uh, like I said, just out of precautionary uh, Cameron Selden is out uh, for spring practice and looks like now Selden may be out till October. I just learned that uh, before going on the air tonight. So, uh, yeah, it's definitely uh, uh, definitely uh, surprising to see. And then Peyton Lewis missed all the spring practice. Uh, so there's another running back that's, you know, going to be behind as far as going into the fall camp. Uh, but Deshaun Bishop looked really good. Kalia Keefe looked solid, so it may be Dylan Sampson, Deshaun Bishop, and Kalia Keefe as your three running backs, and then if they get somebody in the transfer port. Uh, Randy watching us tonight. Uh, Randy Revis watching from Lexington, North Carolina, from Andy Kelly Country. Go Big Orange. Go Big Orange to you, too, Randy. Thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, and Ryan watching us from Columbia, South Carolina. So we got Vol fans. Uh, in uh, Columbia, that is uh, very interesting. There, glad glad you're joining us. Uh, shout out to Kevin and Ryan leaving us a like on the Facebook page. So uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, oh, okay, Cole, tell us Ryan, telling where he's from there. Yeah, uh, 
so yeah, that definitely is going to be interesting to see what Josh Heupel does as far as the running back room goes. Uh, I, I I definitely think he, he's going to test out the transfer portal and try to pick up another running back. And I remember, you know, uh, you know, hearing a couple of years ago that, you know, you need to have five solid running backs to compete in the SEC. And like I said, you know, yeah, Josh Heupel does have a, you know, a very promising quarterback and he's got a lot of wide receivers, but we all know that Josh Heupel loves to run the football too. It's a very balanced attack. Um, uh, so we'll, be interesting to see what he goes in that direction. Kevin watching us tonight, our buddy Kevin, says, I think we have a lot of young talent playing because they are that good. Yeah, <laughs> definitely so. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, I think a lot of part, you know, just, just the, you know, with a lot of players kind of graduating early, uh, you know, in December, January, and going through the spring practice, uh, I think it really uh, gets them ahead of coming in in the summer. And then you're right in the grind of things. So you go ahead and get some of those practices, get your feet wet, kind of get uh, yelled at at your coaches a few times. Uh, and, you know, you're, you know, you go right ahead into the summer camp, kind of know what you're getting. Gavin is watching us tonight on Facebook says, do you think uh, that we will be good? I think we will be a solid team. Uh, I think a team that uh, can contend in the top 12 in the playoffs or at least make it in there. Uh, I like the promise of what Nico can do. Um, I, I, I really love our wide receivers and our tight ends. Uh, the offensive line, if healthy, uh, and I forgot to mention in the Orange White game, you know, you had a lot of y a young freshmen kind of playing that orange wild game. But I think if you get a, if the offensive line gets healthy by the summer and into the start of the season, I think it can be a really explosive offense. I think the defensive line looks really great. I think our linebackers can be promising. And I think our secondary can be improved. Um, you know, obviously it's a different SEC now with the addition of Oklahoma and Texas joining the league. We go to Norman, Oklahoma. Uh in that kind of uh, right in right in September, kind of where we normally play Florida uh, any other year. Now, Florida's moved to October. Um, you know, you're going to have a tough road game there. And, of course, you get Georgia towards the end of the season. So you do have a couple of road games. But you do get some promising home games. You do get Florida at home. You get Alabama at home uh, with new head coach Caleb DeBoer. So we'll see how Alabama will make that adjustment from Nick Saban to Caleb DeBoer and, you know, going through the learning curve with him. So it is kind of promising to get them at home this year. Um, you do go, you take a trip to Arkansas, which I'm not that intimidated with Arkansas this year. Mississippi state's got a new coach. I think we'll do fine there. Um, so it's, it's going to be a little bit different. Um, you know, Kentucky's also on the home schedule too. So I think we can be solid. Um, it's just going to be how Nico will do on the road. And, you know, t unfortunately, Tennessee does, does stub their toes somewhere along the way on the road um, of a team that, you know, looking back probably should have ended up getting the win. But I think they can be solid. And I think they can um, flirt in that playoff discussion, may end up getting in the top 12. As far as national championship goes, um, you know, it's going to be a tall task, especially in the SEC, but, you know, it's looking promising. Uh, shout out to my parents, leaving a like on the Facebook page, Gavin and Chuck also. Uh, Bill says, watching us on Facebook, do you think they might pick some from the transfer portal? I think running back is definitely going to be a position to watch out for, especially with Looks like, uh, as I mentioned just a minute ago, Cam Seldon looks like he's going to be out until October. Uh, Peyton Lewis has already missed all the spring practice. Uh, you do have Deshaun Bishop and Kalia Keefe who's had limited touches. Uh, and, you know, Josh Hypo likes to, you know, balance his running backs out, giving them about 10 carries per game. So I think running back is going to be uh, a position to watch out for. I know there's a kid from Louisville that just – are. Uh, actually, I take it back. He went to Louisville, and now he's already in the transfer portal after four months. I, I heard that name kind of flirting around before going on the air. Um, 
So we'll, we'll see, you know, maybe just kind of a plug and play guy, but definitely running back. Um, you know, maybe linebacker with the addition of Herring going into the transfer portal now, maybe just kind of pick up somebody for depth. But I think mainly running back, they're going to try to lock down that position uh, for the most part. Um, that's, that's where I think they are going to go. But good question, Bill. Thank you. Uh, continue your comments and your questions are coming in right now, and I appreciate it. Um, like I said, you know, we are now almost 100. I think we're now at 138 days, I believe, 37, 38, somewhere around that neighborhood of uh, when the season starts up. So long ways to go. Uh, like I said, transfer portal spring windows open today, uh, and I think it's open for like 14 days, and then – Everybody should be settling into a roster upcoming this season. All right. Speaking of transfer portals, the basketball transfer portal is wide open and going crazy. Uh, when I was at the gym today, I saw that um, Balo uh, from Arizona is now going to Indiana. And um, like I said, you know, we got uh, Tennessee end up picking up a, a big time player in the transfer portal. I want to read Randy's question here. Uh Randy says the three games between the bye week is going to be a little rough. Yeah, um, definitely so. And this year, kind of like in 2019, uh, there are going to be two bye weeks. Each team gets two bye weeks uh, this year compared to one. Um, that's going to be kind of tough. And I think I, you know, doing my research, like the four SEC, I think our first, well, no, I think, right? I was going to say our first four SEC games were at home, but that ain't right because we got to go to Oklahoma. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I, it's going to be, it's going to be a little rough, obviously. And, uh, you know, some tough road games mixing along the way. Um, but like I said, this is, you know, this is SEC play right here. And, uh, you know, you're going to have to kind of <laughs> have to grind it out whether we like it or not, unfortunately. But, uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Randy. Um, so yeah, hoops transfer portal. So Tennessee ended up picking up a player today and, Darling Stone Dubar uh, from Hofstra. Uh, I believe he just completed his junior year. Uh, originally played at Iowa State, then went to Hofstra. Um, he's a 6'8", 211 pounds from Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, this is a guy that came and visited over the weekend. Uh, and, uh, you know, Tennessee scooped him up very quickly. Uh, this fills a need as Dalton Connect now heads off to the NBA. So, We'll see if uh, Dubar will take that spot. I know Kay Tyson, uh, who also paid a visit this weekend from Belmont, I know he's still kind of on Tennessee's radar, and there's a kid from Ohio State, and there's also another kid from uh, the Charlotte 49ers that's uh, still on the radar. But Dubar does kind of clear up a, uh, a roster spot right there. Uh, Tobey Awaka, the rumor's going around now that Awaka may be coming back, uh, you know, Still kind of quiet, but, you know, a little bit of smoke out there, especially since Adu is still in the transfer portal. Although he is going to go through the NBA combine, which uh, kind of – he kind of took my advice, but, you know, not really either. I didn't think he would transfer. I kind of thought he would go through the combine to kind of figure out where he's at, get some outside perspective. Uh, but now he's going to – looks like he's still going to go in the transfer portal, but, you know, we'll see where the Waka goes. Obviously JP Estrella will be back next year. Um, you know, there is, and of course, May, uh, the other name, J. My Mayshack, a name that was kind of getting floated around that he could be hit in the transfer portal too. I think that's now kind of uh, dead in the water. I think because uh, we saw uh, the Tennessee men's basketball team going through the ball walk, over the weekend, and they were featuring J. My Mayshack on their social media pages and talking to him and saying, you know, it's good to be a Tennessee Vol. Uh, so I think Mayshack sounds like he's coming back. Um, so, I, you know, either that, that's kind of the biggest swerve we've seen in Tennessee history uh, from there. But I think Mayshack will be back. Um, and then Ziegler will be back also, and Jordan Ganey and those guys. So, Still kind of a promising team for the most part, even though you are losing three big start, well, four big starters from uh, last year's team. But we shall see. And, we, and like I said, if anything breaks through uh, tonight or tonight or throughout the week, you know, we'll bring it to you on Ball Society a lot. 
All right. Going to the women's, Kim Caldwell has announced her uh, assistant coaches uh, for her upcoming team. A uh, couple of couple of the coaches come from as coming from Marshall to join Caldwell's uh, staff. Uh, Jenna Burnett and An- Angel Riser. So they will be joining Kim Caldwell's team, and then she ended up picking up a couple of players that has SEC connections, and Gabe Lazo, who was an assistant coach at Mississippi State. And Roman Tubnar from Alabama. So, so Kim Caldwell's staff is completed uh, for the Lady Vols. So, uh, excited to see that. Uh, looks like nobody was retrained uh, uh, re- from uh, Kelly Harper's staff, and kind of surprised she went the SEC route. But that does make it very promising that she's taking this very seriously. Randy says, "Kim Caldwell, good hire or great hire." I think right now it's a good hire that can possibly become a great hire. I really like how Kim Caldwell uh, presents herself. I think she is confident in her ability. Uh, I think she uh, handled the press conference very well, especially on John Adams' question. Uh, she seems like she ha- she definitely has the resume to build something Um and I like the staff that now she's uh, brought in. Uh, it's just going to be interesting to see now as we go into the recruiting and transfer portal. Number one, the biggest recruiting tool for her is to figure out who she wants to retrain from uh, Kelly Harper's team last year, who's going to come back and uh, play for her. Obviously, uh, Tess Darby has already announced she's coming back. Joel Spears coming back. I'm assuming like Sarah Puck and A.B. Strickland uh, could be coming back. Um, so we'll see what happens there. Obviously, Rakia Jackson, you know, no longer on the team. Congratulations to her. She's now going to the WNBA draft, the fourth overall pick. By the way, four years in a row for the Lady Balls, first round picks in the WNBA draft. So I guess that's one thing Kelly did very well. Uh, but I think it can be a great heart. I'm excited to see what she's going to bring uh to this program. I think this program can be uh, a very energized program, a team that the fans will really will come out to see and play, could put up a lot of points and play aggressive defense. Um, you know, and like I said, Danny White, we mentioned this last week. Danny White is a very energetic type of athletic director. He likes people with a lot of energy and a lot of focus and a lot of drive and determination. I think this feels like a Danny White hire and we've seen him, uh, you know, at, at his previous stops at Buffalo with Nate Oates and Lance Leipold, who's now at, um, who's now at Kansas and, um, oh, well, Nate Oates is now at Alabama. Uh, and you know, Josh Heupel, while Josh doesn't have that big type of personality, but his style of play definitely, um, shows into it. So, this definitely, this can be a great hire if if everything she's saying comes together, and I think it can be, and I really like the staff that she put together. But Kevin says she likes to play fast. Yeah. Uh, you know, like I said, she was, when she was at Glenville State, she, her team was constantly in the top ten as far as offense and defense goes on the Division two level. She won the national championship in 2022. Um and, uh, you know, same thing at Marshall in her only year, they were both top 10 offensively and defensively in Division One. Randy said, any uh, information on Neyland Stadium upgrades? Um, I hadn't really heard what exactly they're constructing. I know still on the, the uh, plan is to renovate the south end zone to update that, which, you know, I'm a constant um, – a constant uh, fan in that section, or I get a lot of seats in that section, I should say. Uh, uh, so I know exactly how that south end zone, the concourse looks. It is really old, um, you know, very narrow. And, uh, you know, the bathrooms are a little outdated. The concession stands are pretty outdated, um, which does have a nostalgia kind of charm to it, but it also really sp- – shows the age of Neyland Stadium. And if you go around to the east and west uh, sidelines, it's more upgraded and more new. So I know the south end zone still being 
uh, fixed up. Hopefully should be ready. It wasn't ready last year. And then gate 10, where they're going to somehow, I don't know how they're going to do it, is try to either eliminate that big ramp that goes into the upper bowl in the south end zone or try to may check that a little bit and make it a little bit more stream friendly to go into gate 10. Um, for those who don't know where gate 10 is, so gate 10 will be, if you're look, if you're standing outside of Neyland stadium, right? Dead center, it is to the East, even though I'm probably pointing to the West, but it's, it's towards the East. Like you're heading towards Thompson Bowling arena. So the gates are like gates 10, 11, 12, Gate 21 is where the University of Tennessee football team goes in for the ball walk. That's also where the uh, will call is uh, at Neyland Stadium. Um, and a lot of people do go into Gate 21. But I do remember last year uh, a lot of, like, you know, trying to go in different gates and a lot of, like, it was a little bit more challenging to get into some games last year, especially bigger games due to some of the renovations. But I know – the south end zone is still being worked on, and hopefully it will look a lot better because if you do walk around the concourse course at Neyland Stadium, I mean, you know, the north end zone's still a little bit dated, but definitely like the east and west end zones look a lot nicer with the upgrade bathrooms and concession stands, and then the south end zone looks like, you know, 1978 down there, so. Uh, hopefully that kind of answers your question. So it's uh, it, like I said, Neyland does has its charms, uh, but you know, some of it does kind of stick out and kind of interesting there. It, it, you can definitely tell the decades <laughs> throughout the, uh, if you do walk around in there. Um, continue your comments and your questions. Uh, we've got some great ones coming in. Shout out to Tim and uh, Tracy and Andy leaving us a like on the Facebook page. Um, good stuff going on. Um, why are you doing that? Um, Tennessee baseball team, big weekend sweep in LSU. Um, you know, Friday night was a really cool night as Billy Amlick, Billy Barrels returned back to the lineup on Friday night, two weeks after having his appendix removed. Uh, and the first pitch he saw in his first at bat, uh, took it deep in the left field in Tennessee, uh, started a hot night uh, that last Friday Friday night game. And then uh, Dylan Dryland hit a home run in that game Friday and Saturday. And then Blake Burke, uh, him and Christian Moore are now battling for the uh, all-time home run leader, the lead, uh, school leader. Um, both have like 42 home runs in their career. Uh, so it's kind of like a, you know, a mini home run chase there. Uh, but Burke went deep. On Sunday, and I think that Christian Moore did also. Um, but uh, nice showing for Tennessee. You know, LSU, last year's national championship team, got red hot going into the playoffs. You know, had guys like Paul Skeens and Dylan Cruz and uh, Tommy White, which we saw White over the weekend, had a pretty big weekend himself. But, you know, Skeens and Cruz are now in the minor leagues, you know, well high prospects in Major League Baseball. Uh, so they did take a dip this season and you know number 25 in the polls and or in some polls unranked in some polls but you know anytime you beat a uh, national championship team from the year before especially sweep them looks really good uh tennessee's playing bellamar right now and i last I, last i checked it was nine four tennessee in the fifth inning so you know these midweek games are kind of just uh you never know what you kind of get you know you expect to um expect to see uh just kind of wonky stuff there. But, you know, Tennessee now uh, moves to uh, – oh, well, Tennessee now focuses their attention on Kentucky, who is red hot right now, uh, first place in the SEC East. Uh, they're 14-1 and one in SEC play with a three-game winning streak, 16-2 and two, uh, at home, uh, and 30-5 and five overall. So it should be a big weekend. Unfortunately, those games are all online. Randy says, tell us your opinions on the transfer portal – on all sports. Um, the transfer portal, in my opinion, uh, can be a good and bad thing. It just kind of, it's just kind of a case by case scenario. Um, I think it does give opportunities for kids to pursue something bigger. For instance, like Dalton connect, you know, Dalton connect played at Northern Colorado, 
and made that jump to Tennessee and, you know, had an all American season and now going to be a top 10 draft pick in the NBA. So, you know, I'm glad to see that. And I'm not trying to speak that as a Tennessee fan. I've seen it with, you know, other small players. It does definitely give like a guy like a Dalton connect or a Darlington, uh, do bar Darlston do bar or one of these small, uh, kids from the small schools to kind of break out and make the name of their own. Um, and even with football, you know, kind of a Hendon Hooker we saw, you know, went from Virginia Tech, who did solid, and then had a breakout year at Tennessee. Um, I think it does work their work. I'm, and I think also from education perspective, I know there was a player on the Tennessee softball team a couple of years ago had to transfer from Tennessee because the degree that she was in, she was I think she's getting her bachelor's or master's, uh, that the University of Tennessee didn't have, and she had to transfer to pursue her career. So I do like that for that aspect, but, you know, you do – I don't like just players just up and quitting and then, oh, well, I'm just going to transfer, and I can transfer as many times as I want to. Um, I don't like that aspect, and unfortunately you hear more of that negative from that aspect um, instead of more of the positives, but – you know, it's just kind of what it is. And I just think, you know, and, and unfortunately that's just kind of life in general. Um, you know, I've been in the workforce for 20 years uh, at various jobs and I've jumped from job to job uh, due to progression or change of scenery. Uh, so it's just kind of, it's just kind of how life is, you know, we don't really live in the day of somebody working at a, a factory 30, 40 years or working at a particular business for 30, 40 years, you know, we see more people kind of my age and I'm in my late thirties, you know, kind of jumping from one job to this job for a few years to this job for a few years. So it's just kind of a, it's more of just a cultural thing. And I just think it's really definitely, you see it a lot more in college athletics. Um, I, I think sometimes for the good, uh, you know, like maybe a smaller player getting a better opportunity or pursuing an education or maybe, maybe kind of, you know, moving like a, a family member gets sick uh, and wants to move back home or play closer to home to take care of a family member or to say their goodbyes. So I wish you do hear more stories about that. But I think, unfortunately, anytime you hear a, a scenario with the transfer portal, it's always, well, they want NIL money or, oh, well, they, they couldn't really cut it or this or that. Um, I think in theory, it's good. It's just, you know, and unfortunately in the society we live and even in the social media society, uh, it's always kind of looked more negatively and like, oh, they're quitting or this or that. And I just think, I think we need to kind of be careful of how we interpreted it. I'm not saying that, you don't have that. You definitely do have that and probably a little bit more uh, with that. But, you know, I think it's good for that aspect. For me personally, like I said, it, I think the transfer portal mainly for football should have been outside of, you know, right, at the, right as soon as the national championship game ends, you know, go ahead and uh, uh, go ahead and transfer um, to wherever you want to. I really don't like the spring window. College basketball, I think, does it right. College baseball does it right when they do it. But uh, it is what it is. It's just it's just kind of – I just think it's more of kind of – we see it in society in general with our jobs or uh, just people changing and moving. Uh, good evening, Phil, watching us a lot tonight. Oh, also, uh, Kevin, I, should, I forgot to read your comment. I think Kim will be great at Tennessee. Uh, I, I do too. I think it can be great. Randy says, your opinion on Boo Carter, Bradley County. I'm from Ray County. I think he's a great recruit. I got to saw Boo play in his very first game last year when Bradley's, uh, Bradley Central played McMinn County in Athens. Uh, I thought Boo looked really well. Uh, and, you know, anytime you kind of see a high recruit play in a high school football game, you know, you, you, they definitely stand out a lot more as far as athleticism goes and play recognition goes. Um, unless you have like a team that has a bunch of college recruits, but I thought he looked really well. I thought he looked very confident. Um, I, I think he's going to be a playmaker at Tennessee. He's looking really well as far as spring practice goes and, you know, trying to contend for a starting job as a true freshman. Um, you know, I, I'm happy for him. I, 
like I said, I never got to personally meet him. I just happened to saw his first game as a Bradley Bear and saw him take a punt return for a touchdown and uh, just kind of wrecked havoc all over Mittman County that Friday night. Um, but, yeah, I'm, I'm excited to see Boo Carter. I think he can be a, a dynamic playmaker, especially in a secondary that definitely needs um, – that definitely needs some sort of uh, some ump to them that has really been burned the last couple of years. Phil says, what about the new commit from Hostra? So, uh, Darling Stone Dubar. Um, I got to saw a little bit of highlights of him. Um, you know, kind of a, you know, he kind of reminds me of, he's kind of got just uh, Josiah Jordan James size, but, you know, he can pull up for three a lot more. Uh, hello to my grandparents watching along. Uh, I, th- you know, he could pull it from three. He's got a good mid-range shot. Uh, seems like he's very quick with the ball. Um, so I- I'm excited to see what he can do. I think it definitely fills a roster spot, especially in that small forward position where Dalton played. So we'll see if Debar gets it or whoever else may come in from the transfer portal. But I like what I see with him. He averaged about 17 points a game at Hofstra. Um, so, you know, that is promising. I didn't get to see what his field goal percentage was. Um, that's usually kind of why I judge a little bit more better besides just points per game. But I'm sure it's pretty pretty well. Um, yeah, excited to see. Uh, any other questions or comments tonight? Man, we're doing really well now as far as our viewership goes. Shout out to Terry leaving us like on the Facebook page. Um, yeah, a lot of a lot of good stuff coming along. Like I said, you know, busy busy sports uh, month yeah, at the University of Tennessee. Always feels like it's busy <laughs> every year. Tennessee softball team looking very well. Had a nice weekend against Mississippi State. Still number four in the softball poll. So. Uh, Karen Weekly's group still looking solid. Um, we've kind of neglected talking about them a little bit. Um, we'll give them their give them their flowers, if you will. <laughs> yeah, any other questions or comments as far as anything else goes? Um, like I said, we've had a great great turnout tonight. Um, let's see here. <laughs> Phil says, Phil says I'm running late tonight. Hey, you're good. You're good. I, I was kind of running late too. Um, we went live and then I got a notification from Twitter or X that we weren't live. So I had to figure that out for a minute. So started a couple of minutes later, but hope you all enjoyed Rocky Top at the top of the show as usual. Um, we'll probably get a notification from Facebook for copyright infringement, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I need to ask Brad about something too before I get off air. Um, but yeah, a lot of a lot of good stuff coming aboard here. Um, as far as Vol Society goes, like I said, we'll continue with any news breaks uh, as far as transfer portal goes with basketball, uh, with football. Um, obviously, when we get to the hundred days of until it's football time in Tennessee, we're going to bring back the. Uh, Countdown to kick off there. Probably going to tweak it up somewhat. Uh, we've been doing a lot of, we've been doing like the VFLs as far as counting down from 99 to 1 with their jersey numbers. I'm probably going to tweak it up a little bit. I may not do as many VFLs due to, I mean, no offense to the VFLs, but some of the, uh, uh, some of the players from like 1970 and back is a little harder to find their pictures online or it's kind of a, uh, um, not the best quality pictures. So I may tweak it up somewhat. So we'll still do the countdown to kick off, but I, it may be kind of limited somewhat this year. Uh, just so I'm not searching everywhere for them. Because uh, while I enjoy doing it, it is some of them are hard to find. But, you know, look for that here coming up next month. Um, obviously, the football podcast will be coming back in the fall with – Brad Frank, uh, our founder, myself and David Dees with season three of good old Rocky Talk that is coming back in the fall. We'll be talking Tennessee football every week throughout the football season. Um, and uh, like I said, you know, we'll have uh, some of our other shows coming up along the way. 
but always enjoy doing those. Uh, shout out to Tim leaving us a like on the Facebook page. All right. Um, I guess we'll go ahead and kind of wrap it up here tonight. Um, thank you very much for tuning in to Vol Society Live. Um, like I said, my name is David Morrison. I'm the lead analyst here. Uh, like I said, we'll be back uh, probably in a couple of weeks. Uh, kind of take a Tuesday off here. Um, kind of build some news up. And, uh, you know, we'll come back and do another live fan chat with y'all. And, uh, you know, thank you, Phil. And uh, appreciate everybody. Like I said, uh, be kind to everyone. Uh, and uh, we are so grateful for y'all. Thank you for our followers on Facebook, YouTube, uh, X, uh, everybody. And uh, thank you, everybody, with Randy and Phil, uh, Kevin, um, Gavin, uh, Ryan, leaving us questions throughout the night. Appreciate each and every one of you. You guys make this a lot of fun doing these shows. And uh, we'll be back in a couple of weeks, uh, talk some more Tennessee athletics, and uh, let your voice be heard. Appreciate each and every one of you. This is Vol Society Live, uh, and uh, we're so grateful for y'all. Have a great night, everybody, and go Vols.